Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen from Singapore, and welcome to this final session in a series of three Arbor Transition virtual client webinars that have been hosted by Standard Chartered Bank this month. Today, we're focusing on the derivatives market. In particular, you will hear from our subject matter experts on the latest eyeball fallback supplement and the eyeball fallbacks protocol. This is particularly important given the upcoming effectiveness date of the 25th of January. Before proceeding, we wish to point out that today's presentation and supporting materials have been prepared by Standard Chartered for the purposes only of this client briefing. As you would appreciate, Libel Transition is a constantly evolving topic, and some of the information in this client briefing may be subject to change after this date. The presentation and supporting materials are not intended in any manner and should not be interpreted as standard chartered providing advice. We recommend that you continue to obtain your own independent professional advice in this regard. Moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. My name is Carmeny Rambalzik, and I'm from the Central Eyeball Transition Program team. Joining me on the call today is Emmanuel Ramam Brasson, one of the senior leaders from our financial markets team and also an ISTA board member. We have Lillian Ting, our senior legal counsel, and Tech Piaupua from our group compliance team. A few housekeeping points. As we are using BlueJeans events to run this session, we will be sharing the slides on screen and all attendees will be placed on mute. If you are having trouble viewing the slides, please expand the screen or move the slide above, both of which are found at the bottom of your screen. Please note that this is a client-facing session. Throughout the presentation, you may post your questions in the Q&A panel found on the right of your screen. Our panelists will pick up your questions and address them at the end of the session. If we do not get to your question, please be assured that we will follow up with you after the presentation. So please do sign on with your full name and details. Over the next days, we will be sending you an email with a link to our external website where you can access these slides as well as a recording of today's session. We'll now commence the briefing with Emmanuel providing an introduction and opening remarks before we get into the details of the protocol adherence. Emmanuel, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, all from London. Thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Ramonderson. I'm co-head of the FM Financing Security Services team at uh, Standard Chartered. And uh, as Kamini uh, said, I'm also the uh, ISDA board member for Standard Chartered, and I will introduce the session with a couple of remarks. The end of LIBOR is in sight. This will be the end of a long journey since the initial regulatory push in 2017 after all the findings post-GFC. The regulators are aligned, and we are at the final stretch of the journey. We now expect the likely final end dates to be clear soon for all currency including dollar one week, two months, the end of this year, and for the remaining US dollar tenors, June 2023. The ABA consultation results are imminent. Cessations are expected to be declared in 2021 with the end dates that I just mentioned. The derivatives market is a key part of the LIBOR ecosystem. This ecosystem is complex and extends beyond derivatives, cash products, mortgage, bonds, and others. LIBOR references touch our financial systems in many places. It is important for all our clients and the industry in general to get this transition right. The time left to manage this is short, and the issues at hand are many and complex. Why is the ISDA fallback protocol important, and what does it mean to achieve? Legal certainty. The aim is to minimize the legal uncertainty of one's LIBOR exposure on derivatives at the point when LIBORs will end. Operational simplification, of course, is another uh, targeted benefit if a cessation occurs. Minimize the operational elements of bilateral negotiations, if not signing. Simplify the, the transition by allowing a bulking of the processes as much as possible. And obviously, reduce the transition operational risks provide an ability to combine into internal risk and settlement systems the new RFRs. The protocol supports the broader regulatory agenda that I mentioned before. If a majority of participants adhere to the protocol, this will ensure contract continuity in the events of IBOR cessation. 
Nonetheless, signing the protocol is in no way a limit in firms' ability to amend contracts prior to the IBOR cessation. Indeed, active conversion of legacy IBOR stock is encouraged by the regulators. The clearinghouse, such as LCH, have indicated that they will incorporate ISDA pullback in their rule books, meaning clear transactions effectively inherit the ISDA pullback. Thus, adhering to the protocol may help reduce any fallback basis between non-clear and clear transactions. The main objectives of the session are to present the technical facts and state what the market may perceive as the benefits of the protocol. Obviously, each firm should make its own adherence decision. Each firm has to make its own decision taking into account its exposures, products, operational capabilities, and readiness. So the chartered bank, along with many other banks, has adhered already. What will we be... Uh, what will we be covering in this session? Introduction of the ISDA approach to IBOR transition and an overview of the IBOR fallback supplement and protocol, as well as what can be the use of the bilateral amendments agreements and also we'll share with you the bank's LIBOR transition approach. At the end, we will leave time for uh, questions and answers. So those are our initial remarks and I'll now give the floor to uh, our team to comment and go in more details. Thank you, Emmanuel. My name is Lillian. I'm Senior Legal Counsel on the Global IBO Transition Program. So as Emmanuel has alluded to, ISDA has certainly paved the way for IBO transition, particularly in the derivative space. The publication of the IBO fallback supplement and the protocol is a particularly significant milestone. Together, these two documents essentially drive the consensus for the new fallbacks in derivatives contracts. As the existing fallback in current contracts is not sufficiently robust or sustainable in the event an IBO is permanently unavailable, ISDA has done a lot of work through its public consultations to, firstly, develop the new set of fallbacks based on adjusted versions of the risk-free rates, and secondly, to to provide for an implementation approach that is feasible for industry participants. The new fallbacks are not intended to be a primary means of transition. The message from ISDA, the FCA and other regulators has consistently been that the fallbacks are intended to be a one-size-fits-all safety net. As safety nets will only work if they have been put in place, by the same logic, the new ISDA fallbacks will only act as a safety net if they are incorporated into agreements. Various regulators have recommended that firms implement these robust fallbacks in their derivatives contracts as a first step and then use the remainder of 2021 to proactively negotiate a shift away from LIBOR in order to achieve more tailored outcomes. So we have seen very strong support from regulators and key working groups for adherence to the protocol. In terms of numbers, at launch, there were 257 market participants that adhered to the protocol. As of yesterday, there are 7,102 adhering parties, so quite a significant increase over a matter of about three months. These numbers are also published on ISDA's website and made available to the public. The supplement will come into effect on 25th January 2021, the protocol will also take effect on this date for those entities that adhered prior to the 25th of January. Adherence to the protocol is that it applies multilaterally to agreements between adhering parties and therefore it reduces the need for bilateral negotiations, which could potentially be costly and time consuming. Next slide, please. So just before we refer to the table on this slide, it is very important to note for context that the 2006 ISDA definitions is the standard set of definitions that are typically incorporated into interest rate derivatives trades today. The current definitions of LIBOR and other interest rate benchmarks all sit within the 2006 definitions, and any updates to the 2006 definitions are made by way of supplement. So the latest supplement, of course, is the IBOR fallback supplement, also known as Supplement 70. Now let's look at the table. So as you can see, Supplement 70 contains two key amendments. The first is that it amends the rate options in the existing 2006 definitions so that the new ISDA fallbacks are now included. 
The second amendment is that it adds additional provisions that will work together with the new fallbacks and triggers. For the purposes of this webinar, we will focus on the First Amendment, which relates to updating the definitions of the impacted rate options. So just by way of example, let's take the definition of dollar LIBOR BBA, which is a rate option in the 2006 definitions. What the supplement does is that it replaces the current dollar LIBOR BBA definition with a new definition that includes the new as the fallbacks. So just by incorporating the amended 2006 definitions into your confirmations for trades entered into from the 25th of January, the new ISDA fallbacks will automatically apply to that trade. Note that this is already the current practice today for a large number of derivatives trades that are subject to ISDA master agreements, so in this respect, nothing much has changed. Now let's turn to the protocol. Whatever you've just learned about the supplement, applies in relation to the protocol because the protocol applies the same amendments that are made under the supplement but to legacy derivatives agreements. The two key things to note here for the protocol amendments to be made. First, both parties to the legacy agreement must be adhering parties and second, the legacy agreement must be a protocol covered document and we will look at the criteria that determines whether a document is a protocol covered document on a later slide. Next slide, please. So the next two slides are really just a high level summary of what we have just gone through. When Supplement 70 comes into effect on 25th January, all the new trades entered into on or after this date that incorporates the 2006 ISDA definitions will automatically include the new ISDA fallbacks unless the parties have specifically excluded them. And for new clear derivatives transactions, made clearing houses have indicated that they will amend their rule books to give effect to the amendments under the supplement. Next slide, please. As you've seen, Supplement 70 on its own does not amend any transactions entered into prior to 25th January. So this is where the protocol comes in. By adhering to the protocol, adhering parties are able to multilaterally amend the legacy agreements at the same time, such that any eyeball references in these legacy agreements that are protocol covered documents will be updated to include the new as the fallbacks. So please note that the protocol does not cover clear transactions. However, major CCPs have indicated that they will use the powers in their rule books to implement the fallbacks in the legacy clear derivatives agreements. As compared with the supplement which only amends new trades, the protocol amends a broader range of documents. So any eyeball term in the protocol covered documents that comes within the definition of relevant eyeball will be captured by the protocol and amended to include the new as the fallbacks. So this will cover any of those LIBOR references that don't even specify a currency or is defined or described in some free form way and even if it's not in the English language. Next slide please. So as mentioned, a document is covered by the protocol if it is a protocol covered document. Here we've summarized for you the set of criteria that a master agreement, credit support document and confirmation needs to meet in order to be considered a protocol covered document. So note that documents governing clear transactions are not covered by the protocol as we mentioned earlier. For parties who have adhered prior to the 25th of January, these are essentially the existing derivatives agreements entered into prior to the effective date. It is also important to note that the protocol includes a list of non-ISDA documents which are listed out in an additional documents annex. So these include, for example, the JIMRAs, JIMSLAs, the French FBFs, among others that are set out in the protocol. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about relevant eyeballs and the inclusion of fallbacks. This slide sets out on the left-hand side the 13 eyeballs that are covered by the supplement and the protocol, and on the right-hand side we've set out what the first level of the fallback rates are. So on the right-hand column, you can see that other than for the last two benchmarks, the first fallback is essentially to the adjusted risk-free rate plus a spread adjustment. 
for the last two rows, as the Singapore saw and Taibat fix are technically not eyeballs, the fallbacks for these two benchmarks are somewhat different to the other eyeballs. So without getting too technical, just note for the present purposes that the fallbacks for these rates do not apply their respective risk-free rates, which are DORA for the Singapore saw rate and THOR for Taibat fix, but instead they replace the dollar LIBOR input with the SOFA fallback in their fallback calculations. Next slide, please. Due to the structural differences between eyeballs and risk-free rates, certain adjustments are necessary to ensure that derivatives contracts that reference eyeball continue to function as closely as possible to what was intended when the fallback is applied. So as you saw on the previous slide, other than for a Singapore saw and Taibat fix, the first level of fallbacks are to the adjusted risk-free rate plus a spread adjustment. So the adjustments essentially reflect the fact that eyeballs are forward-looking term rates, while risk-free rates are overnight rates, and eyeballs incorporate a range of risk premiums, while risk-free rates are considered to be risk-free or near risk-free. So to adjust for a term, the risk-free rate is compounded daily over the relevant interest period, and the spread adjustment is based on the five-year historical median of the difference between the adjusted risk-free rate and the relevant eyeball. And this spread adjustment is then essentially added to the adjusted RFR rate to derive an all-in fallback rate. Bloomberg will then publish each of these components, that is the term adjusted risk-free rate, the spread adjustment, and the all-in fallback rate. Next slide, please. Now we move on to looking at the trigger events. The fallbacks in the supplement and the protocol will be triggered upon the occurrence of certain trigger events, each being an index cessation event. So we have set out here on this slide the elements of the index cessation event. You can see what the announcement relates to, who makes the announcement, and to which benchmarks the announcement applies. As most of you are aware, the index cessation event covers a permanent cessation trigger, as well as a pre-cessation trigger, which relates to non-representativeness. Whilst permanent cessation relates to all the covered eyeballs we mentioned earlier, the pre-cessation trigger relates only to LIBOR, that is the five currencies of LIBOR. And because dollar LIBOR is an input to the Singapore SOAR and Taibat fix rates, an announcement that dollar LIBOR is non-representative will therefore also trigger the pre-cessation of SOAR and Taibat fix. Accordingly, when an index cessation announcement has been made, there needs to be a date from which the fallback kicks in and applies, and this is termed the index cessation effective date. I will now hand you over to Tech Piao, who will cover the following sections on current alternatives and an overview of the bank's transition approach. Thanks, Lillian. As Lillian has set out, we've covered what the fallback rates are, how the fallback rate work, um, what are the index cessation events, and also an overview of the ISTA protocol. So, as you can see, the ISTA protocol does provide an efficient mechanism for firms to incorporate the enhanced ISTA fallbacks into all the derivatives agreements and transactions um, across multiple counterparties. If both counterparties adhere to the ISTA protocol. So if firms um, have derivative transactions across um, many counterparties, it is indeed an efficient um, tool rather than to renegotiate or to negotiate um, bilaterally with multiple counterparties to amend each document or each transaction um, individually. So while I think the protocol might be something that firms uh, can use, uh, certain firms after evaluating uh, the protocol might decide that it is not for them and be wondering what the alternatives are. So as you can see here, if firms are not planning to use the protocol to incorporate the fallbacks, um, ISDA has actually done um, a set of uh, templates. These are the ISDA bilateral amendment agreement templates that seeks to incorporate the same set of fallbacks into agreements but on a bilateral basis. So what this means is that firms will have to reach out to and engage with and negotiate bilaterally with each of your relevant counterparties to look at incorporating the enhanced fallbacks. 
into your agreements as well as transactions. So as you can see here, there are two, I think, primary form of templates that can be used for negotiations, the short form and the long form. And because it's a set of bilateral negotiations and discussions, a level of flexibility that is there, which is that it allows firms to incorporate additional master agreements or credit support annexes. Um, it can also um, allow firms to exclude certain documents on the reverse. Um, and also, last but not least, uh, firms can also have the ability to disapply the pre cessation provisions. So, this pre cessation provisions is actually a pre cessation trigger that is in the, the protocol, but the bilateral template that allow firms to consider disapplying that if they want to. Next slide, please, Joe. So, for standard chartered, all 25 entities that are trading derivatives have adhered to the protocol. You can see the list here, and you can also find a list of all entities that have adhered to the protocol on the ISDA website. Uh, do check that website, uh, do check the website and the list regularly as it will be updated as and when more firms adhere. So as Lillian said, the number of parties adhering to the uh, protocol has grown significantly since the protocol was launched last year. So, um, as you can see, Standard Chartered has adhered to the protocol and we will actually be reaching out to our clients to look at to at least discuss and engage our clients what your preference is, um, whether you are intending to or have, have adhered to the protocol or you prefer to use the bilateral approach. So that outreach uh, will at least start sometime this quarter and we, we do hope that you have the opportunity to at least review the supplement, the protocol, the templates and, and then so that when the outreach and the discussions start, it will make for a meaningful conversation. So um, we have also heard from a number of clients on what's going on regarding the um, ICE Benchmark Association, uh, but ICE Benchmark Administration's consultation on the proposed cessation of LIBOR and whether that affects any um, cessation timelines. So as you know, the consultation is ongoing. Feedback consultation response closes on the 25th of um, January, so which is next Monday, the same day as the effective date of the protocol and the definitions, actually. So the key message from the regulators is the same, which is that firms should generally stop entering the new dollar light bulb contracts by the end of this year. And any contracts that firms can get into for, especially for dollar light bulb, um, should include the fallbacks or, or a way to reference the alternative in a robust manner. And generally firms should actively transition away from the light bulb market in general in accordance to whatever national uh, working group's timeline. So for example, in um, the UK, the Sterling Working Group has a 31st of March milestone for firms to seize long-dated sterling LIBOR issuances. So what this consultation is, is that um, it, it sets a, I think, a permanent cessation timeline for the various eyeballs. And certainly, um, it's not a sort of reason for firms to delay transition. So we will encourage um, all, all firms to actually keep watch on the closure of the IBA consultation and the subsequent results of the consultation as it will impact um, on transition plans as well as the, the, the pace of transition. So with that, I will, I will hand it back to Kamani to continue the session. Thank you, Chuck Pierre. So we, we have been receiving some questions on the Q&A panel on the right. As I mentioned, you just have to type your question in there and we will pick them up. We will send around this deck uh, in an email uh, in the next few days, but the appendix section in particular has some valuable information around how you can go about adhering to the protocol. And as mentioned as well, the adherence is free for non-ISDA members up until the 25th of January 2021. Uh, we also do have information on the subsequent slide on, on for the number of resources and educational material that appears on the ISDA protocol page and the ISDA benchmark hub. Uh, all these links will be in the in the deck and in an email sent to you later this week. So we might now turn to the Q&A, the questions rather, that are being posted on the Q&A panel. Uh, the first question that we have, uh, and we've got our panelists ready to pick up your questions, uh, the names are up on the screen in front of you. So the first question was around, um, is the adherence pub public and can I see the list of firms that have adhered? Uh, the answer to that is, that the list is, in fact, a publicly available link on, on the ESA website, and I will post the link up here on this conversation uh, or chat, rather, in, in the next minute. The next question is around, when will Standard Chartered share the fallback supplement and protocol 
with parties or already adhering to prior IFTA. So when will we share the fallback supplement and protocol? Uh, to answer this question, this information is already available on the uh, IFTA page as well, and I'm providing links of that here as we are uh, speaking right now. Um, another question that we had is around uh, from someone anonymous. Will, will this also impact fixed swaps? No interest rate risk. Fixed principal only swap repayments are uh, executed. Sam, the, the question is quite convoluted. I'm going to just pass it on to you now and uh, ask if you could please help Sam Phillips. Uh, sure, sure. So um, if I understand the question correctly, um, it's asking, will the protocol have any effect on swaps that are, are pure fixed rate? Um, and the simple answer would be no. So the protocol only affects contracts that have reference to floating rate through the floating rate options. So if you're looking at a fixed rate leg or fixed fix, then there'd be no uh, no change there and, and no fallbacks applicable. Thank you, Sam. Tech PR, did you want to add anything at, at the end here? Yeah, no, only the point that this, I think, obviously, besides is the, um, there are other agreements that are in scope. And as long as I think the firm has established that it doesn't have any uh, legacy LIBOR in scope for its other agreements, then yes, uh, this the, the protocol for legacy trades uh, will not be directly relevant. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have is, what might be the reasons for not adhering? Are there perceived disadvantages? What might be the reasons? Uh, for not adhering. Um, Lillian, we might just start with you, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kamini. Um, so I think this is important that uh, we just want to emphasize that each party actually needs to consult independent advice as to whether they ought to adhere to the protocol because there may be specific considerations um, depending on your portfolio of agreements, which you need to discuss with your independent advisors um, as to what works best for you. What we have presented in this presentation is the FCA's, ISDA's and other working groups' views, but the ultimate decision obviously has to be yours in consultation with um, independent advice. Back to you, thank Carmen. You. Yeah, thank you, Lillian. Uh, we do have now another question uh, being posted. Just give me a sec as they're coming in. My screen is uh, freezing. So how does the credit spread adjustment for US dollar LIBOR be adjusted to the other leg of a cross-currency swap. How does the credit spread adjustment for US dollar be adjusted to the other leg of the cross-currency swap? Uh, Sam Phillips, you're still on the line. Can I pass this on to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll answer in respect to cross-currency swaps in general. So cross-currency swaps obviously have two legs. So you might have, for example, a situation where you have a dollar floating leg versus a sterling floating leg. And in that situation, um, both legs would fall back to their respective risk-free rate for spreads, but potentially at different times. So you might have the sterling leg falling back at the end of this year, if, uh, if that date is confirmed, whereas the dollar leg would fall back um, in the middle of 2023, again, subject to confirmation of that date. So, so indeed, CCSs do have that uh, potential complexity that different legs may potentially fall back at different dates, um, depending on what is finally agreed in, in terms of the organization effective dates. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. We do have uh, another question around, I think it's from Karamiya Mohammed. If a company chooses to renegotiate on the fallback provision instead of adopt the protocol, can it deviate from the protocol? If a company chooses to negotiate on the fallback provision, instead of adopt the protocol, can it deviate from the protocol? Lillian, I'll pass this back to you. Yeah, okay, thanks, Kamini. Um, so I think there are a couple of ways to go about doing this. Um, you could have two parties adhere to the protocol and then bilaterally negotiate the fallback provisions if they need something specific for that particular agreement. Alternatively, as TP mentioned, um, ISDA has actually published two sets of templates. One is a short form template and one is a long form template. So the short form template essentially allows you to simply reference the language in the protocol without much amendment. Um, if the parties are specifically looking to amend the provisions of the protocol, that would be done by way of the long form template, but obviously subject to both parties' agreements as to what 
deviations you want to make in those provisions. Back to you, Carmony. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, another question from someone anonymous. Uh, just to confirm, if we adhere to the protocol, is there no need to renegotiate agreements with our derivatives counterparties? Uh, in other words, the banks. Just to confirm, if we adhere to the protocol, is there a need to renegotiate agreements with our derivatives counterparties? Tech Piao. Yep. Um, yeah. So if you if you adhere to the protocol, um, what it means is that uh, it your counterparties who have also adhered to the protocol, assuming the banks, um, it means that your the, the fallbacks will have been incorporated automatically into the um, any legacy uh, level agreements after the 25th of January 20, 2021. So yes, so there is no need to sort of re renegotiate the agreements as far as incorporation of fallbacks are concerned. So I think what firms will have to also think about is whether um, you would want to actively transition and, and reprice the or the level contracts. Uh, what firms will also have to consider is uh, whether you have any derivatives that um, might not be um, uh, where the fallback um, the box may not actually work directly. Uh, so things like non-linear derivatives, if you so have them. So there are um, a couple of other two considerations that firms would need to think about post the adherence to the protocol. Kamani, back to you. Thank you, Jack Pia. We do have another question from Jeevan Chandra. Uh, can this protocol be adhered after the effective date of 25th January, or has it, does it need to be adhered to by the effective date only? So, Jeevan uh, Chandra, the, the answer to that is you, you can adhere after after the 25th as well. There will be then a fee, a fee involved if you're a non ISDA member. Um, Lillian or Tekka, did you want to add anything to the question from Jeevan? Nothing from me, company. Okay, Thanks. so so Jeevan, just to be clear, the twenty fifth of January is the effective date. It is not a cutoff date uh, for adherence. Uh, we do have a question from um, uh, someone on with regards to uh, Sora. So will Sora be the default fallback for Singapore SOAR and swap rate? Will Sora be the default fallback for Singapore SOAR and swap rate? Lillian, I'll pass this on to you because you covered this in your material. Yep, that's right. Thanks, Carmody. So the first level of fallback for the Singapore store rate um, is actually not Stora. What it does is it will replace the dollar LIBOR input into the fallback calculations with the SOFA fallback, such that um, you're still using the FX swap implied methodology, just replacing the dollar LIBOR input with the SOFA fallback, but you're not actually um, falling back to Sora in on the first level. So I just want to make that clear. And I believe that was listed on slide slide eight. That's correct, if you want to refer back to it. Okay. Back to you, Carmen. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, we do have another question. If the US dollar LIBOR rate uh, is to continue until mid-2023, would the US dollar LIBOR rate still be used until then or cease at the end of 2021? If the US dollar LIBOR rate is to continue until mid-2023, would the US dollar LIBOR rate still be used until then or cease, end of 2021? Sam, you're still on the line. Can I get you to please pick up that? Yeah, sure. So um, all of the cessation effective dates are still subject to consultation. But assuming that the uh, consultation um, propositions are confirmed, then I think, as as Emmanuel um, described in, in the opening introduction, we would see um, the main uh, tenors for dollar ceasing in the the middle of 2023. So three month tenor for dollar would would cease middle of 23, and then the other currencies, um, as well as the one week and two month tenors of dollar would cease at the end of 2021. So to answer the question, if you have a contract which depends on three-month dollar, for example, um, that contract would still reference the uh, dollar publication, uh, the dollar LIBOR publication, until the middle of 2023. So you would not, it would not start to reference SOFA until 2023, um, when the fallback for that tenor um, is effective. Thank you, Sam. 
Uh, that was again from a Karamiya Mohammed. So I hope your question was answered there. We do have another question around uh, Hong Kong dollar or highball. We have an outstanding Hong Kong dollar interest rate swap linked with highball. As there is no time uh, or exact timetable for highball discontinuation, could we just take no action at the moment? In other words, not sign back the protocol and wait until this further updates. Tech PR, any guidance for highball um, or Hong Kong dollar related um, interest rate swaps? Yeah, so as, as you rightly um, pointed out, um, the Hong Kong IMA and the TMA has not set out any um, discontinuation timeline. Uh, for highball, so highball is expected to continue to get published. Um, I think we we would actually uh, maybe say that for for firms with highball drops or highball interest rate products, uh, you that I think Hong Kong Army has also set an expectation that uh, firms should consider uh, incorporating relevant fallbacks, which in this case uh, for this in the derivatives world is um, Honia. So. I think it's certainly something for firms to continue. Uh, again, it's really to ensure that you have robust fallbacks um, built into the existing highball contracts. Uh, that's one. Then two is that obviously um, the protocol or the bilateral uh, amendment agreements uh, will also be applicable to non-Hong Kong dollar, so dollars and others. So the thing is that as if firms are using the protocol or the bilateral amendments uh, to address uh, your non-Hong Kong dollar um, uh, derivative products certainly is Hong Kong dollar should uh, should be something to be considered as well. Given that um, the Hong Kong Army has has indicated that firms should look at robust fallbacks uh, for highball transactions. Come on in. Thank you, Tech P. I'm not sure who that was from, so hopefully that's answered that question. Uh, we do have another question. Given that the credit spread adjustment is based on five year historical period, does it make it mark to market non neutral? At the date of the effective date, uh, Sam, you're on this uh, on this for, for this question. I'll pass to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a good question. Um, so the 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 ESA fallback credit spread adjustment is indeed based on a um, five year historical period. So it takes the the median difference between the adjusted risk free rate and the respective LIBOR over that period. Um, now, because it's based on a historical data set, there's no guarantee that um, when fallbacks are triggered um, that you'd have mark-to-market -market neutrality. So, in other words, there is a possibility of having a mark-to-market -market impact at the point fallbacks are triggered. Now, having said that, the forward basis market, so the market which drives the spread between um, risk-free rates and LIBOR, has gradually been converging to the level of the historical um, is to spread. So to that extent, um, there shouldn't be a huge mark-to-market -market impact um, when the fallbacks are triggered, at least for linear products. Okay, so it should be a relatively um, benign impact for, for linear products um, based on the convergence of the market to date. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we've got quite a few questions, so I'll try to cover them all. Um, there is another question. Are there any legal risks to a company incorporated in India by adhering to the ISDA IWA protocol? Any legal risks uh, in, for a company incorporated in India? Lillian, I'll pass this on to you. Yeah, thanks, Carmody. Um I think this is similar to the previous question where um, I would say any relevant considerations for companies that are incorporated in India in relation to protocol ad adherence um, ought to be discussed with and assessed by your independent advisors and thinking legal, tax, and any other relevant advisors um, that needs to be in the conversation. Back to you, Kamini. Thank you. We do have a question um around um, fixed rate. So if any swap used were referenced to LIBOR in brackets floating and it's converted to fixed rate, resulting in hedging floating rate to fixed rate and getting fixed rate, will the protocol be impacted here? So this is with respect to floating rates and fixed rates. Sam, I'll pass this on to you. Uh, sure. So um, I, I'm not 100% uh, clear that, that I'm following the question, but if the question is saying that you have today some floating rate contract, um, so it could be a, a floating leg of an IRS, 
and then you convert it to a fixed rate, would the um, protocol have any subsequent impact? And the answer would be no. So if, if you converted your contract um, such that it it's only reference to fixed rate and there's no reference to any uh, floating rates, then the the protocol um, would make no difference to that contract. That there'd be no sort of applicable fallback in, in that situation. Thank you, Sam. Um, we, just another question that we've had from um, Jayanta Dasgupta. Is there a provision that after signing the protocol, before the last day of closure of the protocol, the corporate signs bilaterally and hence wants to reverse the protocol uh, adherence. Um, so, Lillian, I'll pass it on to you, being the legal question. Yeah, thanks, Carmody. Uh, so, just to be clear, the protocol, um, there's no date set by ISTA at this point in time as to whether it's um, going to be closed. We can point you to the revocation provisions in the protocol, which provides that after parties have adhered to the protocol and they want to revoke adherence, if you like. It does not impact on the trades that um, have been amended prior to the revocation. So we just want to point you to the uh, revocation provision in the protocol that you have to discuss with your external counsel on, but just be aware that any revocation that takes place after adherence to the protocol will not impact on trades that were already amended prior to the revocation date. Back to you, Carmody. Thank you. We've had a few questions with respect to software term, um, so I'll just try to 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 answer that uh, in just collectively. So one of the questions we had was when when is the forward looking software term rate being published? And we did have another question um, around. Uh, just give me a second. Is there any update regarding term rate of software? Do you have any information when it will be? Uh, available. Uh, the, the the piece of information we can share with you is that, uh, as per the ARC website, we believe that the software term rate is slated for a Q2 publication. So from Q2 of 2021 onwards, that's as per the ARC uh, press release that was received last year. We will be adding the link to that in in the uh, chat here in the Q and A chat. I'm not sure if anyone else on our panel wanted to ha add anything to it specifically, but that's basically the, the timing for software. As we understand it, it's Q2 of this year. Um, another question, would the protocol be relevant to a party who currently doesn't have a liable exposure dealt under an ISDA? Will the protocol be relevant to a party who currently doesn't have a liable exposure? Lillian, I might I, I can take this comedy, yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so just be aware that the protocol doesn't just cover ISTA documents. There is a set of non-ISTA documents included in the additional documents annex in the protocol that will be relevant as well. So these are all the legacy agreements that are not necessarily ISTA agreements. Back to you, Carmen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe a follow-up question for you, Lillian, on the legal side. What happens to the existing derivative transactions of a company if it doesn't either adhere to the protocol or bilaterally negotiate, will the fallback automatically apply to the existing derivative transactions? Um, yeah, okay, thanks, company. I'll take this one. So existing derivative transactions where the parties have not adhered to the protocol or have not bilaterally amended the fallbacks to include the new fallbacks, that means you're technically still reliant on the old fallbacks, which we have mentioned earlier that um, is not necessarily sustainable in a situation where LIBOR is permanently discontinued. Uh, thank um, you. We'd let's see the set. Yeah. Sorry, do I need to answer the second question? Will the fallback automatically apply to the existing yeah. derivative transaction? So the answer is no. It will not automatically apply if you haven't adhered or have not bilaterally amended agreements to include the new fallbacks. Okay, sorry, back thank to you, you. company. No, no, thank you. Um, we do have a question as well around uh, the uh, dates for U.S. dollar LIBOR cessation. Is it correct that only one week LIBOR fixing will get discontinued from 2021 and the rest of the term LIBOR fixings will be discontinued from mid-2023? Tech PR, can you just provide some clarity on that one, please? Sure. Um, I think as a couple of my colleagues mentioned, uh, it's, there is a consultation ongoing. 
So we will only know um, what is the uh, outcome once the consultation closes and, and is announced. So to recap the consultation, uh, specific for dollar LIBOR uh, is actually about cessation, possible cessation of dollar LIBOR, um, one week and two month fixing from the end of 2021. And the other five dollar LIBOR tenors, which is the overnight one month, three months, six months, and 12 month dollar LIBOR tenor uh, from the middle of 2023. So, so besides the one week one, there is also a two month one that is, um, being proposed for, for this continuation at the end of, yes. um, 21. So, like I said, uh, watch, watch, um, the results of the consultation, um, as that will give clarity on when the exact cessation dates are on, um, the dollar level fixings. Kamali? Thank you, Tekpio. Uh, we did have, uh, quite a lengthy, uh, question that's come up, uh, right at the top of my screen anyway. Uh, it's from someone anonymous saying, what happens when there is a fixed rate but the document contract provides for um, for switching to a floating rate in the case of disagreement or for arbitration purposes? Does, the, does that qualify for a contract amendment? And who will check the contract and flag this? Lillian, another legal one for you, please. Sorry, Kamini, um, can I just check? So this is the one in relation to, um, it's what happens where there's a fixed rate, but the document or contract provides for um, provides for switching to a floating rate in the case of a disagreement. Does that qualify for a contract amendment? I've just pasted it in our chat. Um, or All right. Okay. Thanks. The contract and flag this. Yep. Okay. So where there's a fixed rate, but the contract provides for switching to a floating rate in case of disagreement that qualify for a contract amendment. Um, so it really depends on whether this particular agreement is um, sort of carved out from the protocol if both parties have adhered to the protocol and whether the provisions for the fallbacks will be renegotiated as to what the parties want it to be. Um, as to who will check the contract and flag this, um, I would say both parties have um, the responsibility to note this if they are intending to carve it out from the protocol because any carve-outs from the protocol requires both parties' agreements. Back to you, Kamini. Thank you, Lillian. I think uh, while I have you on, there is another uh, short question around. Would the supplement also apply to the ISDA 2000 definition? ISDA 2000 definition. Does the supplement apply to that? Yeah, I can take this company. Um, so the supplement is actually a supplement to the 2006 is the definitions. So it does not apply directly to the 2000 definitions. Okay, so it does not apply. Thanks, Lillian. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Faiz Faisal. Uh, for contracts that are entered after libel cessation, would the spread adjustment continue to be quoted in the contract despite it already quoting SOFA? The contracts that are entered after libel cessation, would the spread adjustment continue to be quoted in the contract despite it already quoting software? Sam Phillips, I'll pass this on to you. Sure. So if you are entering a contract after libel cessation, then that would mean that you are entering into a contract on the risk-free rate. They um, say dollar is your currency and you enter into a contract after the middle of 2023, then most likely your contract would be referencing SOFA. In which case, um, that contract may um, contain some spread that you've negotiated, but it's nothing to do with the ISDA fallback spread. So to answer the question, the ISDA fallback spread would not be relevant if you are entering into a fresh risk-free rate contract. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we do have another one here from... Uh, if this is an anonymous question, uh, the question was, what will happen if we sign an ISDA agreement after the 25th and put a mutual clause or uh, eyeball transition impact, both parties agree, and if we don't adhere to the clause and neither pay the $500, what is the consequence? So what happens if we sign the agreement after the 25th, neither pay the $500, what is the consequence? Lillian, I don't know if you wanted to pick this up. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand, like, I'm, I'm assuming that the parties sign a new ISDA agreement, but both parties 
don't adhere to the protocol, um, it really isn't, I guess, it, I wouldn't say um, this relates directly to the protocol adherence because it's probably, are you saying that when you enter into the new ISDA agreement, which is going to be a new trade, so the new trades entered into on or after the 25th of January will actually include the supplement, a reference to the supplement. So in that sense, your new trades, the fallbacks are covered by the supplement already. I'm not quite sure um, how that relates to the adherence part. Um, if you could just clarify a bit more on that point, please. Yeah. Ms. Sorry, I'm coming. I wasn't sure who asked the question. No, it was anonymous. And also, you know, if you are posting questions anonymously and we're not quite getting to it, please do email us at ibor.transition at etsy.com and we can pick up with you uh, offline as well. Uh, you know, there's quite a few questions on here. We're trying to address all of them. But if there's any follow-up, please, please do email us. There is one more, one question here. What do we do if we're still working under the 1992 ISDA? Lillian, I'll pass it um, to you. Yeah, I can take that. Sure. Um, so the list of ISDA master agreements that are included in the protocol covered documents list does include the 1992 ISDA as well. So if this relates to whether it's a protocol covered document, the answer is yes, it is a protocol covered document if it meets the other criteria as well, the date criteria. Back to you, Carmeny. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, we don't seem to have any further questions here. Um, I think we've addressed all of them. Um, as I mentioned, there are a number of resources on the ISDA uh, website, and we'll provide these links to you. You're, you're able to, to view all the um, adhering parties th thus far. You can also find information on the supplement, on the protocol, and instructions of exactly how it is you uh, do adhere ahead of um, the 25th of January effective date. As we mentioned, it is not a deadline. It's a, it's a date that the, both the protocol and supplement will become effective. Uh, you can still adhere after this date. Um, I don't see any more questions on my panel. So if, um, if there are none, no further questions, we might bring the session to a close. Uh, do look out for the email that will be sent to you the next days with the presentation as well as a recording of today's session. Thank you very much for joining us and have a good day.